said my family was a merchant in Osaka for six generations, but our family lost everything in uh, March 1945, at the end of the war. Yes. So we lost everything, the, everything was burned. My father uh, left the city and went to a uh, countryside and he wanted to be a farmer. And he started to live in the countryside and that was where I was born. But because, uh, you know, my parents had five children, it's really difficult to, you know, raise five children in that small place. So he returned to the city and worked for a small company. Uh, and when I became a teenager, uh, when I had to think about my future, my father said because we lost all the wealth, property, so I'm, I was free. You know, in Japan, you know, I was the uh, oldest son. In Japan, in Japanese culture, uh, traditional culture, uh, all the son had a responsibility to the care of family uh, wealth and uh, business and take care of the uh, parents when they become aged. But he said, my father said, I'm, I was free because I have nothing to take care of. <laughs> <laughs> I had to think about what I should do. And at that time, you know, that was middle of the 60s. Uh, there are so many problems within Japan and uh, in this world. And uh, in Japan, you know, after World War II, you know, Japanese people worked so hard uh, to restore prosperity after the war. They worked so hard to make money. And I didn't like that. In the 60s, Japan became getting become rich country and they uh, started to build Shinkansen, you know, the barrett train line and uh, highways mm -hmm. between Tokyo and Osaka. I lived in the city in Osaka and before that, when I was a child, I could swim in the river, I could, you know, play in the rice field and uh, woods. Uh, but uh, swimming in the river was prohibited before I became a teenager because of the pollution. So that, to me, that kind of so-called progress or development uh, is a destruction. So I didn't like that. And also because of that uh, economy, the Japanese school system was very competitive. So I was always asked from my parents and teacher to study hard to go to a, a good school and I didn't like competition. <laughs> Around that time I start, started to have a question why I have to study so hard at the school and why Japanese people have to work to make money and that, to me, that is destruction of nature and uh, uh, traditional culture. That was the point. I think I was like about 15 or 16 years old, a high, high school student. I started to write, uh, read books about uh, philosophy or novels or history, science, all of to understand why I, I have to live in this way. And the more I read books and think, thought, I had deeper question. What is, the, what is the meaning of life? And I thought, unless we find the meaning of life, I cannot make any right decision to do in my future, for my future. I started to hate school, uh, school life, studying in the school to, uh, you know, memorize everything and get a high remark for the uh, examination and go to a prestigious university. I often escaped from classroom and read books in the library. And I wanted to know, I wanted to know the meaning of life, meaning of, you know, what is happening in human uh, society. My 
the question become deeper and deeper, and I, I reach the point that I believe there's no meaning in, li in human life, because meaning is something we create. Human life, human beings create, or in a sense produce, or find. That is a kind of human reaction to the world. So you know, before human was was appear in this world, there's no meaning. And to me, meaninglessness is more real. Meaning in human world is kind of a fiction. That is what I found. And I wanted to live being free from that kind of fictitious, you know, human uh, culture or civilization. Around the same time, a friend of mine uh, one of my classmates uh, had uh, uh, someone who practiced them uh, in his family. And he uh, stayed at a Zen temple in Kyoto. At that uh, temple, uh, Saoki Kodo Roshi and Uchiyama Roshi lived and practiced with lay people. And uh, that was 1965. In that year, my teacher, Uchiyama Kosho Roshi, published the first, his first book. And when my friend came back from that temple, he uh, allowed me to read that book. That was the first time I encountered uh, Buddhist teaching, Buddhist or Zen teaching, and also my teacher's way of life. And when I read the book, somehow I wanted to become his disciple. That means I wanted to live like him. I was 17. 17. 17. Mm -hmm. He, he uh, described his uh, journey of searching the meaning. So when he was a teenager, he had the same question uh, I had. And he studied uh, Western philosophy at the uh, university, graduate, uh, undergraduate and graduate school, to find what is the truth or meaning of life. And uh, finally he found uh, uh, what he was looking for in Zen practice, Zen teaching. And after that, uh, he continued to practice and share what he found uh, with uh, younger generations. When I read uh, spiritual books, I knew there are such you know, spiritual teachers in the human history, so many of them, but he was a first actual person who lived in that way. I think that was why I wanted to live like him. After that, I studied to study Buddhism and Zen teaching. Uh, and I went to uh, Komadawa University. Oh, be before that, my friend who uh, allowed me to read that uh, Uchiyamuro's book, uh, died next year with cancer. Mm. Uh, he was 17. My, he was cr my classroom, so he was 17. Mm. You know, because he was so young, uh, the cancer grew so quickly. So he died within, her, uh, within a year or so. so not only ab about my thinking uh, or question about life, but uh, I, he showed me actual life and death in front of me. When he died, I found there's no reason he had to die. Of course, there was cause he had to die, the cancer, but uh, I didn't think there was no reason he had to die and I didn't need to die. That means this may happen any time to me and I couldn't complain. From his death, I studied that, you know, our life may end any time, so I had no uh, time to waste. So I should go straight to what I'm looking for instead of going doing something uh, meaningless. Uh, that's why I wanted to study Buddhism, so I went to a, a Komazawa University that was a Soto Zen Buddhist University. And Sawaki Roshi, my teacher's teacher, 
was a professor at the university for many years. So I knew that was the uh, school I could study about what Uchiyamuro uh, wrote. Uh, so I started to study Buddhism. I like studying Buddhism, uh, but when I became a third grade of the university, I found that now I have to make the decision to, be, to become a Buddhist scholar or to be a monk or a practitioner. And at that time, I felt you know, to study Buddhism through studying text and language. You know, to be a Buddhist scholar, we have to study, study many languages, such as Sanskrit, Pali, Tibetan, Chinese, and we had, we had to study two European languages. So my professor said, don't study Dogen, but first study language, <laughs> then uh, study the text. And I felt uh, in order to study, oh, and he also said, uh, in order to become a real Buddhist scholar, I had to study, uh, read books, 10 hours a day for 10 years. And that was the starting point, not the goal. <laughs> so I had to, I had to make decision whether I want to go that way or uh, directly uh, practice. And I felt studying Buddhism through texts is like a, or reading recipes without cooking and tasting. <laughs> <laughs> just, just you know, read and compare which recipes better than others. <laughs> but I wanted to uh, learn how to cook and how and taste, and if it's possible to share the taste to other people. I felt, you know, uh, to become a Buddhist scholar is not my way to go. I was uh, uh, twenty. 21, I he asked uh, Uchiyama Roshi to become, to be ordained, and he accepted. So I was ordained when I was 22, uh, December 8th, uh, 1970. But my father and my sister uh, attended the ceremony even though they are not happy <laughs> <laughs> about my becoming a Buddhist monk. That was how I started to be, to walk this path. When I was 17 years old, I didn't like, you know, Japanese eco economy, not only Japan, but at, at that time, you know, there are so many problems in the world, uh, you know, like uh, Cold Wars and uh, Vietnam Wars. And many American people, you know, came to Asia to study Zen or Buddhism. And they became my friends. And they are looking for something, some alternative way of life from, you know, mass consumption. Uh, economy and politics. But I found uh, that that was not my personal problem or a problem only in Japan, but uh, Western people had the same problems. M most kind of uh, attractive point of my teachers, Wasaki Roshi and Uchiyamura's way of life, is they don't care at all about money or economy, but for them to practice for in poverty is important. Not only him, but in Buddhist tradition from Shakyamuni, poverty is a virtue. Poverty does uh, not mean lack of wealth, but poverty means free from the greed, free from desire. Uh, even though Shakyamuni was a prince, he became a beggar. He gave up everything and he walked on the street and share what he uh, awakened to uh, with, uh, you know, people in poverty. He, was, he received food for, from people. And that was the origin of Buddhist teaching. Uchiyamuro's life was 
almost the same. He lived in a small kind of a poor temple. You know, in Japan, uh, Buddhist temple has many family members and supported by those members. But uh, the temple called Antaiji had no family members. That means no regular income. So Uchamuroshi had to uh, support his uh, practice by begging, exactly the same with uh, Shakyamuni. So he did begging in Japanese called Takahatsu in the city of Kyoto. I was really attracted <laughs> to live in that way of life. So uh, when I became a monk and started practicing at Pantaiji, our practice was completely supported by begging. We didn't charge anything to the people who come to practice with us. You know, that way of life, you know, without thinking about income and possession, uh, was really uh, something uh, attracted, you know, m me. During five years at Antaiji, I practiced in that way. So we had no, uh, almost uh, no personal position at all. After five years, in 1975, Uchiha Muroshi, my teacher, retired. Oh, before that, uh, he, when I started to practice at Tantaiji, you know, there are many uh, Westerners coming to practice with, he, with him, but he didn't speak any Western language. Uh, but he wanted to teach those Western people, so he asked uh, his disciples to study English. And uh, he asked almost all of his disciples, but only three of us said yes, and I was one of them. <laughs> I was not really an interested in studying English at all, but somehow I couldn't say no. <laughs> he sent those three of us uh, to English school in Osaka, so I started to study English. Uh, so when Uchiyamuroshi retired from Antaiji, he asked those three people to come to this country. And uh, we bought a small piece of land in western, western Massachusetts. And we had nothing. We just cut the trees and uh, built a small house. And uh, we started to practice there. When we, I went there, None of us had even a driver's license. And also, we didn't have any financial support from Japan or from this country. So we had to uh, support our life. Uh, of course, we couldn't do begging. <laughs> so <laughs> we did have uh, several uh, odd jobs to support our uh, life. Three Japanese monks lived in the woods in the western Massachusetts and uh, we cut the trees and dig the stumps and made a green vegetable gardens and supported our life by doing odd jobs like uh, picking blueberries or uh, working for a potato farm for harvesting or there was a uh, a uh, tofu factory there. So we had a part-time job. We only worked a you know, few times, few times a day a week. Uh, we lived in a, a very poor life. I think our income, all the three of us, was about $500 a month. <laughs> That's how we lived. And we continued to practice and dozen and uh, uh, working uh, on the land to make it a livable place. I uh, spent life in that way uh, until I became 30. That was my uh, alternative way of life. I wanted to escape from the uh, you know, busy, noisy, money-making machine. <laughs> to me, Japanese uh, society was one huge money-making machine. 
and school was a factory to produce the parts of that machine. And I escaped. And so I, I was really happy to live at Antaiji and live in Massachusetts in that way. So I lived in that way for about 10 years. What I was taught by my teacher was Zazen, so-called Zen Buddhism, and that tradition in Japan uh, started by Zen Master Dogen, or Dogen Zenji, and we call that tradition as uh, Soto Zen. And the main point of Dogen's teaching was just sitting. Uh, we usually think this meditation practice is to attain some kind of enlightenment or awakening. But Dogen said we should just sit without any expectation, even enlightenment. Because we practice in order to get enlightenment, then that is desire. Desire or egocentric desire is still working there in search of truth. So uh, from the very, very beginning, we just, in Dogen's expression, throw ourselves into the way w without expecting any reward. That is what uh, is called just sitting or shikantaza in Dogen's teaching. My teacher's teacher, Sawaki Kodoro, said, Zazen, this sitting meditation, is good for nothing. I always said, you know, this is good for nothing. <laughs> and that is what I recommend people, and it's really difficult to uh, encourage people to practice this way, because this is good for nothing. <laughs> Zazen, without expectation, or without uh, gaining mind, or uh, Zazen, good for nothing, uh, is a co kind of a koan. Because even I, when we started to practice, we have some expectation. I think almost always when, because we have some problem or some difficulty or some question, we start to practice. And so with that expectation, at least to find some answer to question or exit uh, from the problem I have, I, I'm facing. So, uh, without expectation or goal, we cannot start to practice. Here is a, a kind of a, a conflict. We usually call this a way-seeking mind. And with, without this way-seeking mind, or in Buddhist uh, term, bodhicitta, uh, the mind which seeks uh, awakening or find, discover the truth. Uh, we cannot start to practice. But the teaching is you should not even expect the answer. So here is a, a conflict. When we, start, we continue to practice, this becomes a really a serious question. And uh, sometimes we have to face the dead end. That um, in my case, uh, I uh, reached that dead end after about ten years. I after I became a monk. That means, you know, I knew you know that is good for nothing, and I felt it very. I was very fortunate to that teaching. That why I started to practice in that style. So I thought I understood and I like it. Therefore, I devote my entire body and mind and time uh, to this practice. Uh, but after uh, 10 years, I found uh, that was uh, when I was in Massachusetts. We worked very hard physically. So when I became 30, my body was half broken. <laughs> in my 20s, that was okay. But after, uh, shortly after I became 30, my body was half broken. <laughs> so, uh, and I didn't have, you know, uh, income to have a treatment. So I had to return to Japan. So I couldn't practice in the way I 
did for 10 years. And I had a problem. <laughs> I questioned, why is it a problem if that is good for nothing? And I looked inside of me and I f found that, you know, my understanding, understanding of that is good for nothing is only understanding. But I, deep in my heart, I f think, you know, to practice good for nothing zazen is the more, most authentic practice in Buddhist tradition. That's why I'm okay. <laughs> That's why my life is meaningful. I really found in deep my uh, mind, I had expectation. And I felt my ex expectation was filled because of good for nothing doesn't. And I had a problem when I went back to Japan. I, I couldn't do, do that anymore. And that is one thing that means that ain't good for nothing. It's only my intellectual understanding. So I devoted my entire body and mind based on my thinking. It's not really good for nothing. That is one thing I found. And another thing I found was uh, from my childhood, uh, I was, I have been always good boy. When I became a teenager, I didn't like to be a good boy. <laughs> to be a good boy, I think it's a difficult task. <laughs> to be a good boy means I un try to understand what the uh, people around me expect from me. And, and I try to do the way they expect from me. So I felt that is not so honest way of life. First, I think other people's mind, and I try to follow their expectation. When I became a teenager and uh, started to practice Zen, I felt I stopped uh, being a good boy. I kind of uh, betray all the expectation from my parents and teachers and soci Japanese society. So I felt I became a bad boy. But when I became 30, I found I was still a good boy. I wanted to be a good practitioner. I wanted to be a good uh, disciple of my teacher. Or I wanted to be better practitioner than others. I found uh, it's, not on, it's not simply a Buddhist problem, Buddhist problem <laughs> but it's my psychological problem. That means when my body was broken and I couldn't practice, when, uh, I did in my 20s. So I couldn't be a good boy uh, of my parents and I couldn't be a good boy as a Buddhist priest. That's why, uh, you know, I felt uh, my life was really good for nothing. <laughs> and so that was a kind of uh, very shocking to me. And uh, I was in the process of dealing with this for a few months. And uh, at the time I live in a small apartment by myself. So there's no sangha and I, had, I didn't need to any practice as a priest. I, I was just me. Uh, one day, I found myself sitting alone, not as a practitioner within the Sangha, or not as a Buddhist priest, in a kind of a uh, social occupation. <laughs> I really sat myself and I found uh, deep, peace there. That means I don't need to be a good boy. I can be just sit. And I found that is really a uh, zazen that is good for nothing. But before that, I, I intellectually understood uh, zazen is good for nothing as a Buddhist philosophy. 
but still, but because of that, I felt my life is okay, yes, yes. meaningful. When I couldn't continue in that way, I felt my life is not valuable. Mm -hmm. But I found that is the ground mm -hmm. we need to practice with that desire to be a good boy, in, not only in the secular, mundane way, but even as a Buddhist. I became free from my desire to be a good Buddhist. Yes. Finally, I, th I think first time I found f the real meaning of uh, that is good for nothing, or practice without expectation or gaining mind. So just be there with this body and mind. You know, I was born in Japan and uh, grown up and educated in Japan and uh, because my teacher asked me to come to America, I moved to America and have been practicing with American people for many years. Somehow, you know, you know this practice is really good for nothing. <laughs> Still, some people, it's strange, some people come to practice with me, you know, this good for nothing thing. I really appreciate both people who are interested in good for nothing thing. So I really wanted to express my appreciation and gratitude that I all the support and the participation from all people, not only in this country, United States, but people come from Europe or South America and other people, other places. So I'd like to uh, say thank you to all those people who are uh, interested in this strange teaching and practice. Uh, as far as there are those people, you know, this tra tra tradition continues. Uh, it took me a long time to become free from desire or expectation. So to me, that is a doesn't good for nothing or practice without gaining mind is a very difficult koan. Because of that, you know, I started to start around, I was 30. Uh, I started to practice, practice uh, without any, you know, expectation. I feel, you know, I don't need to be a good boy. I know, you know, uh, I'm still a good boy, in a sense. <laughs> I'm not so bad. <laughs> but when uh, I felt I behave like a good boy, I can kind of uh, make fun of me. I'm not uh, caught up with my desire to be a good boy, but I see you know, that is a problem. From the very beginning of Buddhist traditions, uh, breathing is a very important point of meditation practice. In some traditions, they count the breath or they watch the breath. Uh, but in Dogen Zenji tradition, we don't count breath, we don't uh, watch breath. Uh, some people, even in Soto Zen tradition, they encourage their student, but uh, at least in my lineage, Sakura Shi Uchamurashi lineage, uh, we don't watch breath, we don't count breath. We breathe as natural, naturally as possible. But still it's important to breathe uh, abdominally. That means we breathe through our nose as if the air goes down to the abdomen. During the Zen uh, or meditation, we make sure you know, when we are breathing, the stomach is moving. This is important to have a deep breath. That means uh, air uh, goes in our body. My teacher said this is important. Uh, attention is always here, but it should go down here. My teacher says, uh, you know, sometimes or often meditation practice in Buddhism is a practice of concentration. We pay attention one object to concentrate in order not to 
think or enter the world of thinking. But in our tradition, or just in just sitting, we don't even do that. That means there's no one uh, object to concentration for concentration. But Uchamro said our practice of just sitting is like uh, driving a car. If when we are driving a car and we pay one particular object, uh, then it's dangerous. But when we drive a car, we have to. Our mind should be everywhere, not only something in the car or something outside the car. But uh, our mind is nowhere. Therefore, our mind can be everywhere. So something happened inside or outside. Uh, can adjust. So that is awareness or awakening in our practice. Even when we sit in this way, you know, our brain is still working. You know, our stomach is working and our heart is working. There's no reason only our brain stop working. And the function of our brain is produce thought. So in our Zazen, thoughts are coming and going, and our practice is not stop that. When uh, those thoughts coming and going became object of this person sitting, then our mind is separate into two parts. The thoughts that become object, and this person is thinking about this thought. This thought become object. And sometimes I like this idea, or I hate that idea, or I, I become angry about some memory. Uh, if we do such a thing, you know, our mind is separated in two parts, subject and object. Uh, that is a problem. So that is what we call thinking. So when we find uh, our, we are thinking, that means there's a separation between Within our mind, subject and object, we stop that. That is what let go of thought means. Or in my teacher's expression, opening the hand of thought. Thought are just coming and going. That is a natural function of our brain. But when we grasp it, then we are thinking. We are, I, I'm thinking about this thought, whether it's right or wrong, or good or bad. I found we, I do this, then there are two sides. And when we found it, we open our hand and return to just sitting. Means uh, deep breath and uh, upright posture and uh, keep our eyes open. That means not sleep. Uh, when, we are, when we are sleepy, we are dream. We, in, in this quiet, quiet con condition, uh, sleeping and awakening is not so clear. Often uh, I think I'm waking, but somehow in my mind I'm dreaming and I, th I think I'm thinking. <laughs> but that is, that is a very difficult condition. But whenever I found I'm sleeping or dreaming, I wake up to the soul, you know, we, I uh, make sure our, my eyes are open w without seeing anything. So, uh, you know, this upright posture, deep breath and uh, not sleeping and letting go of thought, those are the four uh, points we return. Uh, but often we, de we deviate from those four points. This, this is just sitting. But uh, when we found we deviate from, you know, just sitting, we return to just sitting. That means posture, breathing, uh, not sleeping and letting go. That is what we do in our uh, meditation practice. So actually this is not really meditation. Thoughts are coming and going, but we don't think. So our uh, business 
in doing, in sitting facing the wall, is keep returning to this posture, breathing, uh, not sleeping, and letting go. Yes. And th this cannot be done with our thinking. Stop thinking is another kind of thinking. So we don't even uh, think, think, think not to stop, not th thinking. But uh, my teacher said, this is done with our body, not with our mind. About his dozen, uh, Dogen, uh, the founder of Soto Zen tradition, uh, called uh, dropping of body and mind. Dropping of body and mind. That means we sit uh, this body and this mind, uh, but mind is empty. We don't try not to do anything with our mind. But uh, so in our practice, body is really important. Uh, keep this upright posture and returning to this posture and breathing. So mainly, uh, you know, the Zen means sitting meditation. But Dogen often called this practice as sitting instead of meditation. For him, just sitting is dropping off. Dropping off means when we grasp, it doesn't, it, it stick. But when we open our hand, it drops off. That means we become free from our clinging to our body and mind. Then uh, this body and mind is only uh, five skandhas, only collection of five skandhas. And uh, that is the time when we are free from this clinging, when we open our hand. Then we, uh, not we see, as a subject, but we become one with all beings. You know, things are coming and going, uh, like AI is coming and coming in and going out. And uh, if there is some sound, sound coming and going. So nothing stay here. So these five scandals really become emptiness. So our practice is not uh, contemplating about emptiness as an object, but we become empty. Five scandals being five scandals that are empty. That is our practice. That's why we cannot make sure, you know, I'm, I'm, I attain that condition or stage. If when we evaluate what is doing, then again there is a separation between subject and object. So our practice is without any uh, evaluation or judgment. So that is another meaning of just sitting. When uh, we sit, we don't really listen anything. Uh, we don't pay any attention. Uh, you know, if, that's even the birds are singing and we are sitting. If I listen to their uh, singing and thinking these are the birds, then it's not Zazarna anymore. S even when I do this, you know, there's a separation between person sitting and the sound. There's a kind of an interesting koan story in Zen, and Dogen likes this. A teacher asked a student, uh, showing, pointing the wind, wind wheel. And he, the teacher asked, is the wind make sound? Or does the bell make sound? Uh, then the student said, my mind makes sound. Neither wind nor bell, but my mind makes uh, a sound. That means, uh, you know, when uh, wind blow the wind bell, uh, it makes the vibration. And the vi that vibration uh, of the air reach to my ear, then it becomes sound. So before the, you know, the vibration reaching my ear, there's no sound, right? 
sound, so sound is only inside of our mind, our mind. I think that is why that the student said, my mind make, sure, make the sound. But Dogen said that is not true. Uh, because, you know, even if my mind is working, if the, uh, the wind doesn't blow and the ring, uh, wind bell doesn't, you know, sh shake, and uh, the air doesn't vibrate, then there's no sound. So all of them are making sound. That means en this entire universe is making sound. So there's no uh, subject who listen and no object that or sound that is uh, heard. That is uh, what Dogen called it a total function. We are part of it. So there's no such uh, person who is listening, no sound that come to me, but this entire world is making that sound through this person. And this person is only tiny part of it. And this is based on the basic uh, Mahayana Buddhist teaching of uh, interconnectedness. At that time, when I studied Dogen's teachings, he talks about three kinds of time. One is, you know, our uh, common sense time that flow, flows from past to the present and the present to the future. And the things are happening within this kind of like a time flow, uh, flows, it's like a stream of time. And I was born at certain time in the past, now I'm here and at present, and sometime in the future I'm going to die. That is a common understanding of time. But Dogen said that is not only the way we can see and we understand the time. Uh, if we take a, look, a close look at time, we find this present moment is only actual time because past has already gone, so it's not reality anymore. And the future has not yet come, so it's not reality yet. So only time is this present moment. And uh, this present moment has no length. Even if there is a slightest length, then I, we can still cut into two. And this part is already past, and that part is still in the future. So th even though this present moment is only actual time, but it has no rings, it's zero. So in this sense, time disappeared. Only yeah, just here. Even here, when I speak or think about here, still there's uh, rings. So this actual present moment cannot, cannot be the subject of our thinking. We can't feel it, you know. But when we s just be here, that means we stop thinking about the flow of the time and just being here and be one, just be here, then we become one with the time that doesn't flow. That means from the beginningless beginning and to the end of endless end, this is one seamless moment. Time flows only in our thinking. Because of my memory about the past and my hope about the future, it seems time flows. But if we don't measure time, that means without human beings, you know, uh, from that time, moment of Big Bang until today, until now, this is one moment. There's no such segment. These segments are created by human thinking. That means fiction. So this uh, first common uh, sense idea of time is a fiction or created in our mind. But uh, before human beings appeared on this planet, then 
there's no such you know time flows. I call this eternity time that doesn't flow. When I read Dogen's teaching, there are three kinds of time or three ways of viewing the time or understanding the time. In the first kind of time, in common sense, my friend died uh, almost 50 years ago. Uh, and uh, he is uh, existing or alive uh, in my mind as his memory. And he is still alive. That means uh, because of what he did to me or for me, you know, I'm here and I'm doing this. If he didn't go to the temple and allowed me to read my teacher's book, I, I'm not here. So he's still alive in me. And also within this time which doesn't flow, you know, we are always together. So uh, that is uh, how we understand, you know, we are connected with not only my friend, but my teacher, uh, Uchiyamura, she died uh, 1998, about 20 years ago. But when I sit, I felt Uchiyamura, she's sitting with me. So time is kind of a very interesting thing. So Do Dogen, when he discussed about time, he said time can, fri can f uh, fly or move from future to the past, present to the past, not only from past to the future. Language is a problem. <laughs> in Buddhism, not only in Buddhism, in all human cultures. Uh, especially in Buddhism, when uh, Buddha awakened to the reality or Dharma, uh, he had hesitation to, start to teach, because he, uh, it said he thought that truth or reality he discovered was too deep and too subtle beyond human thinking. Therefore, there's no way to communicate uh, with other people. Even as uh, he explained, uh, no one could understand. So he, uh, said he thought it's easier for him to just, just be there by himself and, and uh, quietly die. But somehow, you know, the God, Indian God Brahma, came down and asked him to teach. I think that was a uh, very difficult time for Buddha. In order to teach, he has to translate what he experienced uh, into language. And that, it took uh, at least uh, several weeks for him how to teach, how to express what he discovered using language. So it was a big challenge. And this, this challenge for Shakyamuni still continue today. What is the Dharma as reality? And what is the expression of Dharma or explanation of Dharma using language? When we study even the Buddhist sutras, we are thinking using discriminating mind. And we think using a, a concept or concept and logics. That is how our brain works. Otherwise, we don't understand what is said. Often this uh, written teaching or written expression of the reality is uh, called a finger uh, in the Zen tradition. Finger that point the moon. So the real thing is not the finger, but the moon. But often we think, we think about the finger. So it's really a challenge for uh, all the Buddhists. How can we see the moon instead of finger? Often uh, the masters, without explaining using uh, 
was concept and logic. Uh, he, their uh, famous teaching method is hitting, shouting, and uh, speaking something nonsense. That is the, to help their students to become free from their uh, conceptual thinking. Uh, that is one part of very important than teaching. But uh, Dogen has, uh, in a sense, very unique uh, the master. Uh, for him, expressing the Dharma using language is very important. He said, when we experience something, unless it, can, it is expressed using language, you didn't really express, experience it. So language, uh, expression using language is really important. That makes our understanding also clear. So uh, Dogen and another very well-known Soto Zen monk, whose name was Ryokan, he was also famous as a poet and calligrapher. Ryokan said, a finger is also a moon or finger is a part of the moon. In Dogen's tradition, uh, language is really important. So he, that why, you know, his writing like a Shobo Genzo is really difficult. He, he can ignore even uh, uh, grammar yeah. or customer, yeah. customary uh, expression, habitual way of thinking or he changed even the saying or expression uh, appeared in the sutras or at the master's uh, sayings. So he, uh, he, in order to use language as an expression of reality itself, uh, his way of reading, thinking, and writing is very creative. That's why his uh, writing was so difficult for us because we are, unless we understand what he experienced, and what he uh, tried to express, you know, he, just reading his uh, words doesn't make sense at all. Uh, practice the same thing mm -hmm. or, uh, with him. I think that means in his case or in our case, uh, practice Zazen and experience what he experienced. It's really important to understand his uh, language. Uh, and when we share the same experience, we see the language is actual uh, expression of what we experience, same as Dogen. Sonomama is, I don't think Sonomama is such a simple word or a simple thing. You know, Sonoma is just as it is before uh, being observed by human beings, before human beings uh, expire, appear in this world. That is Sonoma. But when uh, human beings uh, appeared and become an observer of things happening, human beings create uh, some thinking. And that is not Sonoma. That is a copy of Sonomama, copy of the reality, using our thinking. So our thinking is like a screen, and we create a copy of the reality. And we think that is not Sonomama, but that is a kind of a fabrication. That, so it becomes a kind of a complicated. <laughs> And also, and yet, when we think of human life, uh, having this screen, living uh, with the ability to make the copy of reality is reality. That is our life as it is. So uh, we, cannot, we cannot say if we stop creating the screen, then we become one with Sonomama. Then uh, it's another, another fiction. So, Sonomama before human beings and Sonomama as a human life should be uh, integrated.
that means we, we as a human beings, we are living with our ability to think, that means to produce something artificial. And we need to know that some that production is not reality as it is. But we have to live with this ability of creating something fictitious. That is a human life as it is. So it's really complicated in a sense. And so we have to see all those uh, three aspects of Sonomama. And somehow we need to go back and forth. That means we sometimes or often we negate our fiction. Mm. But we also negate about uh, negation of the fiction. Mm. Otherwise, we lose us uh, as it is in us, as human life. So uh, this is the same as reality and language. Yes. If we negate language, then there is no way to live as a human beings. So uh, we have to include or back and forth that uh, language or thinking uh, is not as it is. And yet, without this, there's no such thing called as it is. So uh, our life is not, not so simple. Of course, as a Buddhist, uh, Zen is a part of Mahayana Buddhism. We take refuge in Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Those are basically fat. I don't know if love is a good word or not, mm. but in a sense, that is love. Mm. And uh, Dogen says, Buddha is a good teacher, and Dharma, Buddha's teaching, is good medicine, and Sangha is good friends that help us, each other, to recover the health, mental health. Those are the three most valuable things for all Buddhists. But those, according to Dogen, those three are not really through three different things. But uh, Buddha, as Dharmakaya, or Dharma body, is this uh, entire universe, entire reality. And Dharma is how uh, all beings are within this uh, entire universe or entire uh, network of interdependent origination. And all beings within that interconnectedness are Sangha. As a religion called Buddhism, Buddha, Dharma and Sangha means Shakyamuni and his teaching and people who study Buddha, what Buddha taught. According to Dogen, those are not only a uh, way to see those three treasures. But this entire universe in which we are living, and how that is Buddha, and how those things are existing, that is interconnectedness, that is Dharma. And all beings existing within this interconnectedness are Sangha. So actually this is what we love <laughs> and we trust. I think uh, the very basis of uh, Mahayana Buddhist teaching is interconnectedness. Because we are, each beings are empty, that means lack of uh, self-nature, that is an uh, independent entity. We, are, we cannot be an independent entity. We can uh, live or exist uh, within interconnectedness. Uh, that means we are supported by all beings, not only people, but we are supported by air, water, and everything. There is no way to live without uh, uh, gratitude, because we can live based on you know, support by all beings. Without support by all beings, cannot really even exist. You know, we, our thinking is very ego-centered, but this ego-centered way of thinking 
can be <laughs> because of the support by others. You know, even our language, you know, in my case Japanese, uh, is a gift from the Japanese society or tradition. You know, Japanese people lived in that islands uh, had been developing the language, and because I was born, somehow, you know, uh, I was given Japanese language as a gift. And I use the lang Japanese language to create a very egocentered <laughs> idea. <laughs> so even our egocentricity is a product of interdependence. So uh, we cannot live without gratitude, appreciation to all beings in which we are living together. I think the basis of forgiveness is uh, repentance. In a Bodhisattva practice in Mahayana, teaching, Mahayana teachings, uh, vow and repentance should be always together. Vow, you know, we take four Bodhisattva vows, being a numberless, we vow to free them. The religions are inexhaustible, we vow to end them. Uh, Dharma gates are boundless, I vow to enter them or master them. And Buddha's way is unsurpassable, we vow to realize it. Those are four Bodhisattva vows. So all, bo all Mahayana Buddhists need to take those four vows. And yet those four vows are really endless vow. That means there's no time we can say I have accomplish all those four vows. There's no, no uh, way to completely accomplish, fulfill those vows. That means our practice is always incomplete, no matter how many years, we, how long we practice. So uh, the another side of practice basing, uh, uh, based on our Bodhisattva vow is dependence. And repentance is not something negative. It's not something like, uh, I'm sorry I made such and such mistake, and I try not to make another mistake. But uh, rather, repentance is uh, awareness of uh, how incomplete we are. So we, as far as we practice based on vow, we have to practice repentance as awareness. Uh, and this, uh, because of this uh, repentance or awareness of incompleteness, uh, it's kind of natural if you know, other people make mistakes and, uh, and I cannot you know, judge they are bad. You know, I am right because, uh, you know, there is a kind of a, a famous saying by uh, <coughs> Prince Shotoku, who, who was the f uh, almost the first Japanese person who studied uh, Buddhism in the 6th century. And he said, what I think right might be wrong with other people, and what uh, they think right is not right to me both of us might be wrong. So, that, so we are both ordinary, deluded human beings. So that, I think that uh, awareness that we are not complete, perfect person is a ground of forgiveness. I think vow is not something uh, we think and we promise I do such and such thing. But the vow, uh, at least those four Bodhisattva vows, is based on the way we are within uh, the network of interdependent origination. Uh, because we are living together with all beings, we have to uh, live based on that reality. And yet that is very difficult to understand and see in our way of thinking. That's why we need those vows. Those vows are not, uh, how can I say, came from our thinking. That's why, you know, in order to 
in order not to be deceived by our thinking that is always uh, self-centered, uh, I think we need wow as a, a part of interconnectedness. We need to vow to live on that uh, reality or, or fa foundation. But our thinking is always deviated from uh, that reality. You know, for all of us, me is most important than others. Others are not so important, like me, myself. That is a kind of a natural thing in our thinking. In order to put more value, on that reality, fundamental reality than my thinking, my personal view, personal limited, habitual way of thinking. Uh, I think that is why we need power. Well, religion is a kind of a tricky word. <laughs> Uh, Uchamura said, I don't like religion. <laughs> you know, uh, in a kind of a common sense, religion is something we have to believe, uh, even though it's difficult to believe. Uh, let me talk about what uh, religion in Japanese means. The equivalent Japanese word for religion is shūkyō. Shū literally means uh, basic truth or reality, and kyo is teaching. Originally, shū kyo uh, is a Buddhist word. That means the reality Buddha awakened to, and Buddha's teaching, the basic reality and about the teaching about that reality. That is the definition of what shū kyo means. And this word shū kyo is used as a, as a equivalent of English word religion, and religion means to be connected with God again, right? To recover the connection. So religion and Japanese word shūkyon are two different things, and yet, and yet, you know, we use as an equivalent. That is kind of a problem. When Uchimaro talks about religion, he's thinking about shūkyo that is basic reality and teaching about that reality. Importance of religion or shūkyō uh, in these modern times is we need to awake to that fundamental reality in which we are living together with all beings. And how we need to think how we can live without, in a sense, uh, destroying the interconnectedness, or destroying or injured. But we, modern civilization, uh, destroy that or injured the interconnectedness. We don't mind about, you know, some, you know, living beings uh, cease to be uh, if we are happy or to make our life more convenient or uh, materially abundant uh, and enjoyable. We don't mind about other living beings. I think that is injuring or even destroying this interconnectedness. So to do so, to uh, awake, that is a problem, or the problem of modern civilization or material civilization. We need uh, to wake up or awaken to that basic reality and try to live that reality. If that is religion, or that if that is shūkyō, then shūkyō is, I think, the most important thing for us modern people. But in that sense, religion is not some kind of a doctrine, system of doctrine we have to believe without thinking. It's not an institution. Yeah, awareness or awakening and practice based on that awakening, how we are. Ritual is important, in, especially in the monastic uh, practice. It's almost everything is rituals, and that is a, a, a expression of our awareness of basic reality that we live together uh, with others in harmony. How can we uh, express this awakening through our um, 
body and mind. How through our actions or uh, how to use our body. So almost everything in the monastic practice is rituals. And somehow I didn't like it. <laughs> it's too much, uh, too much formal. And uh, within the long history of that kind of traditional monastic life, ritual becomes simply uh, or em empty forms. The spirit is not there. Especially the monks who live there for many years, you know, they can do things based on that form, rituals or formalities without uh, thinking or without put themselves in that formality. So uh, somehow I didn't like monastic practice. <laughs> it's become really, really uh, meaningless forms. Uh, but ritual is, I think, still important. When we awake to the fundamental reality we are living together with others and our uh, wish to live with others in harmony, we have to show uh, you know, our gratitude or appreciation to others. And uh, in a sense, uh, not, not really monastic, but community life is a kind of a, a miniature of this network of interdependent origination. So we live together and help each other and support each other, but because we can be very egocentric, so we can uh, injure each other or harm each other. So it's important to express our uh, gratitude and appreciation to others to do so. Uh, we need some expression using language or how to use our body. And uh, some rituals such as you know making prostration or uh, in Buddhist tradition we do gasho. This uh, gasho and the bow this, uh, I think, this uh, gesture, I think, is the same as our Western uh, culture uh, as a, a shaking hand. That is, when we uh, put uh, these two palms together, we cannot hide anything. That means we cannot hide weapon. That so this. Uh, uh, gesture shows I have no intention to harm you. Uh, and from this position, we, we cannot attack uh, the person in front of me unless we do something, one action, then the person can escape. So this means I have no intention to attack or uh, injure or uh, harm you. So this is an uh, in expression of uh, friendship and respect and intimacy with the person. And uh, another way of making prostration is much more polite way of expression. I think that came from the way uh, slaves or servant showed their uh, gratitude to their Lord. That means when we make prostration, in that case we have to put our uh, both hands, both uh, elbows and uh, forehead on the ground. That means we cannot attack at all, we cannot do anything. But the person in front of uh, you, uh, standing, can do anything. It's really vulnerable posture. But uh, so, uh, without a perfect kind of uh, slander or obeisance, we cannot take this posture. And we do this in front of Buddha. That means, and we hold our hands palm up like this. That means we, we place Buddha's feet on our uh, hands 
and that is higher than our head. Our head is the highest point of our, ourselves. But uh, this posture means I put Buddha higher than myself. This is a kind of expression of I completely take refuge in Buddha and Buddha's teaching. And we do the same uh, posture uh, or prostration in front of uh, our teachers. So uh, this is a ritual, but this is the expression of uh, respect and uh, taking refuge. But you know, unless we are uh, careful, we can do this without thinking. That's just a habitual, you know, greeting. So uh, our mind is our heart. In the, in the form is really important. Form and mind or heart should be together. Otherwise, this simple, simply just form is not so meaningful. The important point, I think, is face the question. If any young people have a question about their lives or about how people live in the society, uh, this question is very precious mm -hmm. and try to find uh, the answer to that question and try to find if there are some people or person or people who uh, seems, how can I say, be the answer to that question. Yes. So some uh, predecessor mm -hmm. as a teacher or example uh, is important. Otherwise, the people who have que such questions become a kind of uh, uh, negative against the mm. society. Mm. So I think that is important to find, uh, to uh, deeply und understand the question. Yes. And uh, find the uh, example if uh, that person or people who had the same question and found some way he, they, uh, could live positively. About a teacher, Dogen Zenji said, without true teacher, it's better not to practice. So true, having a true teacher, finding a true teacher is the most important thing. And to me, Uchiamuroshi, my teacher, was a true teacher. And I was really fortunate from the very beginning, I found a good teacher. Dogen says it's important to have a true teacher, and I thought my Uchiamurashi was a true teacher. But uh, Uchiamurashi said, I'm not a true teacher. I cannot be a true teacher. True teacher is your other thing. No human beings can be uh, absolutely true teacher. All human beings are simply ordinary beings. That is one thing he said. Uh, so true teacher is the Dharma and Buddha and our practice. No human beings can be true teacher. That is one thing he said. And another side he said, as a human beings, true teacher is a person who don't say, I am true teacher. I make no mistake, so you have to uh, follow everything I say. <coughs> you have to believe everything I teach. But you should see this is an ordinary human being, so it may, might make mistakes. And for him, that is true teacher. The true teacher should not think he is true teacher. So I think there is both identity and disidentity. Yeah. That is a very important point. He didn't uh, attach himself to become or to be a true teacher. But he is always humble. And he always uh, say, you know, I cannot do this I, and I cannot be uh, always correct. And that is fine. But to teach that all human beings are limited, is a uh, true teaching. I cannot say uh, in general, but in my case, when I was, uh, I was in confusion, I have many questions about life, 
uh, as an example, Jamro shows how to live as a way seekers. I think to me that was most deep, deepest service I received, most deepest offerings human beings can do. Of course, there are so many good things to do, and that is all good. But to show the deepest, deep meaning of life or how we are within interconnectedness, and show it as an actual concrete example. I think uh, that was most uh, our deepest uh, offering one person can uh, do. In Buddhist traditions, uh, awakening or awareness to the reality, we are living together all beings and uh, live based on that reality, I think is most healthy way of life. So I hope this tradition uh, based on living based on that uh, awakening to the reality uh, and also become mature to live in that way. I think it's what you know Mahayana Buddhist teaching is all about. So I hope you know this way of life continued in the future. As far as there are some people you know, live in such a way, then Buddha's teaching is alive. Uh, you know, I don't care so much about you know, the Buddhism as an as a, uh, institution, whether or even the name of the word, uh, name of Buddhism. But if you know, people live without becoming Buddhist, if they live in that way, that is fine. So, uh, you know, my mission is to transmit and continue this tradition. But if people uh, in the future uh, think they don't need uh, such a religion called Buddhism, that is fine. But I hope those people can see that reality and live together with all beings.